evening. I am Tania Leong, Composers Now Artistic Director. Welcome to the virtual opening event of the 2022 Composers Now Festival. Composers Now celebrates and honors living composers, the diversity of their voices and the significance of their artistic contributions to the cultural fabric of our society. The Composers Now Festival is a citywide month long music event that highlights today's living composers, brings together performances presented by venues, ensembles, orchestras, opera, musical theater, dance companies, as well as many other innovative events throughout New York's city five boroughs. This evening and across the entire of the February festival, you can explore sounds from jazz to indie, from classical to electronic and beyond, and enjoy a sonic journey through the landscape of the arts of our time. Tonight, we open our online event paying tribute to David Del Tredici and Mary Watkins by awarding each of them the 2022 Composers Now Visionary Award. We honor their legacy as composers, performers, mentors, role models, and their prestigious service to the arts. Following the presentation of the Visionary Awards, we present the world premiere of Ebon Oguntola's Chamber Trio, a young recipient of the 2022 Composers Now First Commission Award. Composer and saxophonist Erin Rogers served as a Bond's mentor of this composition. Then we feature a short video capturing composer Son Akin and visual artist Andre Velo, recipients of the December's 2021 Creative Collaborative Residency. This initiative is made possible by the Pocantico Center of the Rockefellers Brothers fun. The evening is rounded out with performances of works by Rohan Chanders 2021 electronic piece written for pianist Vicky Show, and works by Joy Goodry and Jonathan Saraga. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our supporting foundations, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, our generous contributors, and the Composers Now team. Enjoy the evening and let's hope we will be sharing in person again soon. I began my musical life rather late. And I realized in the eighth grade that if I took piano lessons, I would not have to play baseball. However, as soon as I began, I loved it. I did nothing but practice. And by the time I was 17, I made a debut recital in San Francisco. So I was launched when I was in my junior year at uh, University of California at Berkeley and went to the Aspen Music Festival to study with Leonard Schur, a very famous pianist of that time. Well, he was a wonderful player, but it was a mean-spirited teacher. So to spend the time happily in music, I could either sing or write a piece. So I thought I'll write a piece, something that had never occurred to me in my piano playing days. So I wrote this fantasy, Opus One, and I played it for a friend of mine, Robert Morgan. He said, come to Darius Mio, the famous French composer, play it for him, which I did. He said to me, my boy, you are a composer. Soliloquy is my most dissonant piece, practically, and it was my first piece. I had a very advanced piano teacher at the time who, who was interested in all this music. Uh, his name was Bernard Abramovich. He came from Germany. So I learned these very difficult pieces, and, and it became natural to me to hear dissonance. In those days, it was so exciting to be atonal because it was so new. We were happy with our, our kind of uh, wholesome, heartfelt, wheatland music, which in a way was what my generation had been fed on. So to have this other totally horrifying aesthetic that was atonal, 
was thrilling. When you're a composer, you want to be different. You want to have something special to say. You want to be shocking. You want to get attention. So uh, this, this filled the bill. Uh, my first vocal compositions were settings of James Joyce. I wrote four pieces, four songs to James Joyce texts. I Hear an Army, Night Controverse, and finally Syzygy, the most complex of the pieces. Or well, by the time I got was writing Syzygy, I was very involved with mechanisms, devices, music that went backwards and forwards. I was, I was entranced by the palindrome, which as you know in the words is like, for, for example, the word madam, M-A, then a center, D, and an A-M, backwards. Syzygy is full of these palindromes and additive rhythms, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one. At the same time, I was interested in, in extremes of sound, especially the second one, uh, Night Piece, speaks of the distance of the stars from everything else and this huge void in, in the middle. And some, some of that appealed to me. And I found a kind of metaphoric parallel in using piccolos up there and uh, contrabassoons down in the bass. I had a radical shift in musical style after my Joyce songs, particularly after Syzygy. And I always blame my becoming so tonal on Lewis Carroll. Someone showed me the, the actual book, Alice in Wonderland, and I said, it's too slight. And then someone else showed me the book called The Annotated Alice by Martin Gardner. And in that, it shows that for every of the, each of these slight poems, there are two or three are poems that they're based on or parody, Victorian ballads and stories. So I was excited then. So that then I began to be interested in it. And I felt, at first I took only the most severe parts of the Alice in Wonderland story, like the Jabberwocky was the first thing I said. And for that I used an atonal language. But as time went on, I, be, I got interested in, the, for example, the Mad Tea Party, or in Final Alice, the, uh, the suppressed love theme of Lewis Carroll. And I needed another language. Somehow atonality didn't do it. So without really being conscious of what I was doing, I reached back into the, my tonal piano days. I mean, I was very skilled at writing tonality. So that began my, my gradual immersion in tonality, thinking only that it reflected in a more three-dimensional way what was happening in the book. In no way did I plan to write a whole series of Alice pieces. I began with one, the Papyri. I enjoyed that. I thought of the Alice's Adventures in Wonderland as a series of short stories. Each chapter is complete, and the only continuity is that Alice is the thread between each story. In uh, Adventures Underground, my piece, which is a setting of the famous Mouse's Tale, which is a poem written in the shape of a mouse's tail from the top, big letters, sp spins around and comes down to tiny little letters. To set that, I thought, I really must set the shape. So I had to make, I invented a piece that where every page looked like the mouse's tail. The problem was you can't hear it. So it still had to sound good but yet be a visual joke, if you will. I've never had such a mind-twisting problem. The biggest of the Alice pieces that I wrote to this point was Final Alice, written for the Bicentennial of the U.S. in 1976. and by, It was commissioned by the Chicago Symphony. George Schulte conducted it, and the newly discovered soprano Barbara Hendricks sang. I wanted to show the love of Lewis Carroll for Alice. This, this is controversial, uh, but because there were a number of poems that reflected th the love quite clearly of Victorian originals, which Carroll parodies and makes obscure with these little nonsense texts, I put, them, I put back the original Victorian ditties like evidence that he did really love Alice. And to do that, I thought these forbidden texts should be set in a forbidden language. And of course, at this time, tonality was forbidden. I use a concertante group of solo instruments, mandolin, banjo, accordion, two soprano saxes. The reason being, I wanted a group of instruments which are completely inappropriate to the orchestra. So they would represent Wonderland. So you see them sitting on the stage, you know it's not going to be something that's not all right. In the acrostic song, the very end of Final Alice, being an acrostic, the first letter of each 
line of poetry spells out the true Alice that he loved, Alice Pleasance Liddell. Uh, and so when I set the poem, I thought, too bad you can't really appreciate that it's an acrostic. So I thought, of, well, you could if at each l first word, somebody, in this case, I made the orchestra, says the letter. So you'd hear whispered A, L, I, C. So you would actually hear the visual device of acrostic. After I wrote Final Alice, and with his huge splots, patches of tonality, interspersed with a lot of atonality as well, I wanted to try and write a big piece that was completely tonal, that had none of the atonality. So that became In Memory of a Summer Day. It's a setting of the two preface poems, there are two books. In each part, the preface poem from the point of view of the little girls, he took out on the river to Thames to tell the stories. And then in the last movement, the, the point of view of Carol, so much older, telling these stories. And it did win the Pulitzer Prize in 1980. I was really surprised because it was, it was such a tonal piece. It was shockingly tonal in a time where it really still was not okay to be, certainly not to be encouraged with such a thing as a Pulitzer Prize. My last Alice piece was the, was the opera Dum Dee Tweedle. I ran into some personal difficulties, which caused me to go do a lot of therapy and, and explore what was going on inside me. And I discovered a, a, a gay men's workshop called Body Electric. And I went to that place, uh, and I went for this week of intense, intense sexuality, connection. I got emotion, and I came back. To Seattle, so it was like a little uh, excursion. Uh, but I had with me a couple of poems that were written by people at the this workshop, and because I missed the people, I kind of set the poems, and, and I set them very very easily. And these turned out to be were the first uh, non Alice poetry I'd set in, in 20 years, and so this began the br the break with it. I wanted to write about my gay experience about sexuality because as a classical composer, I realized it's n never written about. So I thought this is a new area and I want, I'm in a position now to create a body of music which is explicitly gay and there it would be, it would exist, you know, and I think it is necessary that that happen because to make anything visible, you need literature around it or you need some kind of hard stuff to, uh, to document it. So that began my odyssey of uh, exploration. Well, among the, the songs that I did write, I wrote about five or six big song cycles, uh, one of which was the, the three baritone songs. Uh, well, they're typical, uh, typical of uh, the things I was interested in. The first one was by Rumi, and Rumi was a, a kind of a gay mystic from the, from the uh, when it was sixth century. I said a poem of a, a friend of mine, who, which was about a gay, a gay drunk. And then I set finally Matthew Shepard, also by a friend of mine. And of course, that's the famous story of uh, Matthew Shepard being uh, killed. One of the la big pieces that I wrote was called uh, Gay Life, which is for baritone and orchestra. It's a setting again of five sexually charged or gay charged poetry uh, combined into a cycle. I, I also was very touched by the AIDS crisis. In, uh, I had a lover who died of AIDS during our time together. So that really you know, made the gay connection very real and very, uh, it affected me. So it, it, uh, it changed too the direction of the poetry. I've, I've written a lot of chamber music recently for string quartet, I've written several string quartets and clarinet quintet and a lot of piano music. Uh, 
I, it's strange, I always thought since my playing piano days was my beginning, that my, most of my career was not writing piano music. So now at this later stage, I'm suddenly writing a lot of piano music, a surprise. And every turn I realize I have taken in my career has been a surprise, uh, whether it's Alice, Carol, uh, gay poetry, beyond. And I like that. I think it, it kept me vital. And I'm looking forward to a lot of uh, creative years ahead of me. Years ago, I read Taylor Branch's Parting the Waters, which was the first of three volumes covering the broad spectrum of the 1960 civil rights movement. And I was greatly inspired by that book. Now, a lot of people outside the communities of color had trouble understanding the depth of feeling among those of us who were on the other end of the hostility that often accompanied uh, demonstrations and marches. <clears throat> but I've been blessed with the opportunity to comment and bring awareness to that period through the music. What I've most endeavored to impart musically is the spirituality that propelled and enabled the participants to persevere in the face of hostility, hatred, and violence that did on occasion involve serious injury and even death. I feel that my task as a composer is to present the love, the determination, the inspiration and the belief in the righteousness of the cause through the power of music. Before I present my music for this event, I want to thank Tanya Leon and Composers Now for the 2022 Composers Now Visionary Award and the opportunity to share two arias with you. The first is Mamie's Lament, and this is from the opera Emmett Till. It is Mamie Till, um, who is uh, Emmett Till's mother, singing about the loss of her son. The second aria is from Dark River. Dark River is about the story of Fannie Lou Hamer and her work in the civil rights movement in uh, Mississippi in the 1960s. She was one of the first black people to register to vote. She had uh, volunteered to be involved in, uh, in the civil rights work in that area and her husband, Pap, was very concerned. He was, you know, he feared for her safety and he really didn't want her to do this, but, um, <laughs> He knew that Fanny was a determined woman, and once she made up her mind, that was pretty much it. Um, and that was probably the thing he loved about her the most. So he, this, this song is about his reaction to her decision to become involved in the civil rights movement. It's called Pap's Song. Baby boy 
Oh! 
everyone. I'm Erin Rogers. And I'm Abuna Gintola. Ibn, can you tell us a little bit about the piece you've written? Yes. So the piece is named um, Interim, and it's for a uh, saxophone trio, specifically soprano, alto, and baritone, and also electronics, and specifically the looper pedal. And um, it's basically a piece that tries to comment on how much time has been distorted in this period during the pandemic with so much going on and how time seems to be moving so quickly, yet so slowly at the same time. And that's the basis for it. What did you find uh, valuable from the mentorship process in writing this piece? So when I first heard about the electronics, I. I, I, to me, it was extremely daunting. I never really worked with um, electronics in my music uh, to an extent where I could be confident, um, but I learned so much about how it works and through experimentation and, uh, and mentoring, I was able to really um, grow, grow more comfortable with it and um, create music that I was proud of. That's great. Uh, what is the actual electronic element in this piece? So I have a looper pedal. Each saxophonist will be able to record. Um, and after they finish recording, it'll keep on looping over and over again until stopped. And that is really, really helpful and cool because it allows you to create an even more full sound with less instruments. 
Thank you very much. A few months ago, uh, composers now recommended me as a mentor for Ibun and for this process. And um, I'm really excited to have been part of the process of, of, of you writing the piece, but also to be part of the premiere in playing the piece. And uh, two of my colleagues in the New Thread Quartet will perform it um, due to uh, COVID-19. Of course, we're doing it uh, virtually. So we won't be playing it in the same room, but we have all of the same elements that have been written for each part and we'll be playing it as a virtual premiere for you tonight. I'm also uh, really, really thankful for Composers Now and for this opportunity to have met you and to see this piece progress. And uh, to Tanya Leon, Amy Frawley, everyone at that organization. Um, Imun, did you have anyone you wanted to thank? Yes, um, I also want to thank um, Composers Now and to Tanya Leon. Um, also for the sponsors of the First Commission Award, uh, Michael Menard and Phyllis Ross. And definitely thanks to Missy Mazzoli and Ellen Reed from Luna Composition Lab for allowing me to have this absolutely amazing opportunity to work with such amazing musicians and be a part of this wonderful artistic journey. <laughs> Thank you.
just one simple symbol, but it talks about side blow, which means victim is the powerless one and the powerless one will, will suffer the pain later. Ever since the pandemic started, the Asian hate crime increased like, extensively and as a composer, I felt a great passion to address this issue and the emotional abuse and gaslighting, manipulation going on in our community. As a white male, if you're kind of part of the cohort in general that is responsible for this violence, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And part of our process, from my point of view, is for me to spend time with somebody who deeply understand that and is affected by the issue and then channel that into the visual piece that I will then create with her. I brought this flat but grayscale piece. This is a kind of a style I thought we could use as a kind of a basis for mm -hmm. because if you make it too dark it looks mm -hmm. too dark. Right. You know. Right. So if you see if we could take something like this and then create something like this and then gradually colour it in as kind of the damage or whatever, and then create some kind of video piece out of that in it. But it's right, getting there. I see. It's yes. got something. Mm -hmm. We met at Bethany Arts Community, and we just loved both of our works. You know, when you talk to somebody from another discipline who's covering the same themes, especially when they're challenging, it's not just rewarding, it's like kind of validates what you do yourself. Andre works to blur the boundaries of gender. It's sort of like body figure, but it's kind of ambiguous. As a visual artist as well, you want to challenge people. And when, when I heard your work, you know, immediately, <laughs> you know this is not going to be an easy listen, right? <laughs> This is the kind of music that I kind of connect to because it, it has sounds and movement. I felt myself on a wave of this emotion that was going through it. This is challenging music. It's the picture on the side. And then we're going to like illustrate unprovoked attack, which will appear in a pixel later form, which will appear... I always want to talk about social justice and you are so ready to have a conversation with me. 
I am collecting photos of my friends' faces, and Andre will manipulate. A portrait of an Asian woman who is then abused in an Asian hate crime. How am I going to present this? Society doesn't want to admit this and see it's happening. So I'm going to use my pixelation techniques to create a, a video piece. An end result might not look like someone's yeah, exactly. face, but as a totality, everyone's face will be there as yeah. a little part. Yeah. You know, you walk in that line trying to engage people, you can scare them off and then they won't even engage with their work and then you go and challenge them. The general day is just two people living in a house together, right? <laughs> Talking about this very important topic. It's like a reflection time. Where? We have this solid base. We totally understand what the project is about. We have this time to completely talk through the issues and what we really want to achieve. It's incredibly peaceful. That kind of environment leads you to is the conversations where you're having very natural interaction and some idea it starts flowing from that. Yo, Wizard Rohan coming at you right now to talk about my piece, The Tragedy of Ikikomori Loveless, which I wrote with and for the illustrious Vicky Chow last February for one of the Bang on a Can online marathons. My full name is Rohan Chunder. I also go by the artist name Ayer, and I primarily make electronic music. I met Rohan during the pandemic because we were paired to do one of the Bang in a Can online marathons. So he was commissioned to uh, write a piece for me, and he, he and I clicked right away, and we had very similar ideas and thoughts, um, especially talking about identity and um, just health and mental health awareness. Um, and uh, all, a lot of psychological issues that I don't think music uh, necessarily usually addresses. I think my conversations with her really impacted the concept of the work and the way I approached my identity and body. So I hope you all enjoy watching this piece and really see that play out. You can of course catch this track, which is out everywhere, courtesy of Cantaloupe Music, um, now. And the rest of the album, uh, Final Skin, which will be out coming later this year. So much love and uh, keep it real.
have chosen path triangle. Will you kill him? Will you let him survive? In my head, my name is Commander Lobo. I have no real interest in the outside world. This is a shelter for me. This has been my environment since I was born. I can make changes by selecting emotions and facial expressions. I can choose between different eyebrows. Almond shaped eyes would be great. My name is Hikamori Lovely. This is a shelter for me. My name is Hikamori Lovely. I can make changes by selecting emotions for facial expressions. I can choose between different eyebrows. I am shelter for Hikamori Lovely. I can make changes by selecting almond shaped eyes for my shelter. I have no real interest in facial expression. I am looking more lovely. I am not in the shelter of my environment. I can select emotions for my shelter. I can select different eyebrows for my facial expression. I can be beautiful to my environment. Beautiful to my environment. I can be beautiful if I want it. I can be alone if wanted. I will be alone if it's not wanted. I will be alone because I'm not wanted. I'll be here in case I'm beautiful. I'll be here in case I'm beautiful. I'll be here when I'm alone. I'm alone because I'm beautiful. My name is Hikamori Lovelace. I am alone. I will be alone. I'm not beautiful. I'm not as beautiful as I wanted. I'll be here alone till I'm beautiful. I will never be beautiful out there. My name is Hikamori Lovelace. I'll be here in case I'm beautiful. I'll be here when I'm alone. I'm alone because I'm beautiful. I'm only beautiful in here. Because I'm alone. If you love him, you may meet him again in another lifetime.
this is the ending where he dies in beauty's arms. Hey y'all, I am Joy Guidry. I'm a bassoonist, composer, and visual artist currently based in Brooklyn, New York. I'm extremely excited to be a part of this wonderful evening tonight with so many other incredible artists. Um, tonight I'm sharing a piece with you titled Face to Face. And in this track, um, it's essentially telling the story of having to face so much hatred, um, racism, transphobia, homophobia, just so many different types of oppression. Um, and it's also just, I want other people to look into themselves and see like, how have I not listened to myself? How, what are my inner demons? What is my inner child trying to tell me? How can I be a better person to myself mostly? You know, it's, it's important that we are wonderful to everyone around us. Um, but it's also so important for us to listen to ourselves and give ourselves what we need to not overexert ourselves and help everyone else before we help ourselves to make sure we're healthy and happy, make sure that we have inner peace at all times. So with that, with this track, it is very, a lot of deep tones. Um, it reminds me of a black hole. Um, that was my inspiration for this work. And I created this visual along with it using my GoPro Max 360 camera. And it's one of my favorite tools because you can just bend the angles in every different direction. And um, it was, it was just very fun um, learning how to do video editing and just capturing video during the pandemic and kind of having it as a, a new skill, a new, a new hobby of mine. So um, the visual goes along with that and the visual really is about space exploration and it could be outer space that we know or it could be the universe that is inside of us. I choose to think of it as traveling to the universe inside of myself to look for my soul, look for my inner child, look for my demons to see how can I just pull all of that out and listen and learn and be better to me, which will help me be better to others, you know? So, um, yeah, and this track just really goes along with that. There's a black hole in the visual. It was really fun. It, I don't know, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm excited for you to see it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that means I should stop talking soon. Anyway, um, this track is the second track on my album, um, which is coming out February 4th on Wadded Speculature Records, and it'll be available everywhere, but go to Bandcamp. Um, <laughs> And the album is titled Radical Acceptance. And it's essentially kind of what I was talking about, but there's nine tracks and each track is about something different I have had to radically accept in my life. Um, I've had to radically accept people that um, have told me they love me, will not support me in being trans, being gay, being queer, you know, all of these things. Um, I cannot change how the world looks at me as a fat person, but, I can change the way I look at myself. And it's a long journey, but it's all possible. So each track kind of goes along with this narrative um, for nine tracks, about 45 minutes. And I'm just really happy to tell this story and it's finally gonna be out there. But for a little more context, the track before this one um, is titled, just because I'm a dick doesn't mean I'm a man. And the way I end that track is talking about other people are gonna have to deal with their own problems. We're gonna have to deal with our own problems. So it goes directly into this track um, with no break. It's kind of the same music and just flows directly. And after me speaking for about two minutes, it's time for me to go on my own journey. If you choose to go on that journey with me, I invite you. We have a lot to learn about ourselves. We have to a lot to learn about each other and the future is gonna be bright. The future's gonna be bright. 
I'm really excited. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy Face to Face. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Jonathan Saraga. I'm a trumpeter and composer based in New York City. And I'm very honored to be a part of the Composers Now Festival Virtual for 2022, the opening event. And the piece that I chose for this event is titled Recurring Dream. I originally wrote it back in 2012. It appears on my first album, which came out in 2013. And I chose this piece because it's one of those pieces that hasn't really been performed that much, at least not as much as uh, many other pieces over the years. And I think that's just because I never really felt that that particular piece um, was was completed in the way that I uh, would have wanted. It's 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 definitely complete, but it just never felt as whole as other pieces. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to take a look at it and see if I could uh, patch it up and uh, smooth it out in the way that I currently you know, would, would hear the piece. So I thought that this event was a, an opportunity for me to do that. And um, it's sort of like, I feel like my pieces are all sort of part of a big family and um, I want each of them to have an equal amount of, of love, you know? I want each of them to feel loved and um, seen equally. And I felt that that piece wasn't um, being seen as I would want it to be. So that's sort of uh, why I chose it. And I arranged it for quartet, which it was originally arranged for quintet, and added some different things to the arrangement, took some things out of the arrangement, and just had a different type of vision and approach to how it would sound and sort of the general story that I wanted to tell through this piece. So I hope you enjoy Recurring Dream.